uh, Shane from Liberty Under Attack here. I hope you're doing well. I'm coming to you today with a uh, very special interview. Uh, joining me is Pete Cisco from Resilient Personal Freedom and PeteCisco.com. Uh, how are you doing this evening, sir? I'm doing well. Great to be here, Shane. Definitely, definitely. So, well, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It's definitely a pleasure. Uh, so, so I guess to preface this a little bit, uh, I, I had on Jake DeSillis. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Uh, I reached out to him for another interview on making money on the Internet, and uh, he was uh, unavailable. So uh, he pointed me in your direction. Uh, and by that time, I was already on uh, you and Connie's email list, so I kind of already had a taste about uh, uh, what you guys uh, did and what you guys discussed. Uh, so it worked out worked out pretty well, uh, honestly. So uh, why don't you go ahead and int introduce yourself to the listeners and uh, let them know who you are and, uh, and, and what you do. Well, thanks. Uh, I have uh, spent the last... Um uh, 15 years, uh, earning a hundred percent of my income, uh, online. So I was sort of an early adopter to e-commerce and, uh, embraced it quickly. And, uh, I'm a very enthusiastic proponent of it, uh, in terms of the freedom that it can deliver to people. Uh, my wife and I have spent the last 10 years traveling, you know, basically nonstop, uh, two people, one suitcase each, and uh, we've lived all over the world, uh, lived in, uh, oh, you know, depending on how you define lived in, you know, 8, 10, 12 different countries. Uh, wow. Right now, I'm talking to you from Ireland, and uh, we've been here about three months and really liking it uh, here. Um, before this, we lived in, uh, well, we visited Thailand for a couple of months. We try to spend time in Thailand every year because it's a, a favorite of ours. Um, and we lived a few months in uh, mainland China, uh, primarily because two of our sons uh, were teaching English in uh, in China, and that that was the attraction. Mainland China is not that sort of user friendly in terms of being an expat, but uh, when you have family there, that that makes it completely different. So um, that's. Uh, that, that's what we've been doing. I, I lived in uh, the United States for 20 years, raised a family there. Uh, uh, I'm originally from Canada, so technically I've, I've been an expat for 30 years. Hmm. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah, you definitely, uh, you definitely been, uh, been all over. So uh, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I mean, can you, can you kind of tell us a bit about your path? How you, how you, uh, I got came to entrepreneurship and volunteerism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just kind of give us your, I guess your, uh, your, your brief history, so to speak. Well, those are two sort of, you know, mostly unrelated paths. I, I, I have sort of been entrepreneurial by nature. Uh, since a young age, when I was uh, 18 years old, I, I had my own business and I had, was largely self-employed um, right through my 20s and 30s and, uh, and into my 40s. And um, uh, a lot of that time, I, I either had a business on the side or all I did was run my own business. So I've been entrepreneurial for a long time. And as a lot of people know, that dovetails nicely when you have a sensitivity to personal freedom, personal liberty, living life on your own terms, all of those things. Uh, there are so many advantages to uh, being self-employed if you, if you care about those issues of freedom. Uh, they, they go together. So uh, two different paths sort of to get there, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely they are, uh, they are, they are related. And in, in terms of voluntarism, uh, that is actually a term that I've uh, started using more recently. I, I started out sort of philosophically being attracted to, uh, the, the arguments of reason, uh, things that are grounded in, uh, observable evidence and empiricism and things like that. Uh, the 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 tenets of science just appeal to me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that was always uh, the direction I gravitated to philosophically. And when you have those principles in mind, and at a young age you start thinking about you know, what, what's the right way to live or what would be the best way for most people to live? 
I think it uh, takes you in the direction of individual liberty rather than uh, living under, you know, sort of the, the, the problem of the tyranny of the majority over the minority. Mm -hmm. um, people vote for things. It's fine for the people who want them. What do you do about the people who didn't want them? Well, yep. <laughs> you, you know, you, you force them to do it anyway. Well, how do you force them? Well, you're going to need, you know, you're going to need some institutions that, uh, you know, literally force people to do things. And at some point, you're going to come face to face with a guy with a gun who says, do what we say or, or get in the cage. And we'll, we'll leave you in the cage until you start doing what you're told to do. And I have a philosophical problem with that and have always tried to find ways that uh, would uh, obviate uh, that problem, you know, just transcend it, just have it not occur. And uh, I, I did, I wrote a book uh, on that subject called uh, The Freedom Map, um, uh, How to Build True Freedom uh, Through Contractual Republics. Huh. Contractual, contractual Republic is, is just a term I use for a society that can function on truly zero coercion. And it's, it's fine to talk about having no coercion, but there's quite a lot of work in figuring out exactly how you would do that. You know, what, what would be the institutions that would enable that? Uh, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, and that's why I wrote that book. Okay, okay. Can, can you, I, yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that part of it, but can you, can you kind of fill us, uh, fill us in on, on what, what, what you mean by contractual republics? Well, uh, the, the concept is that uh, the, the way for people to transact between themselves is by mutual agreement. Uh, and the thing to avoid is to have any transaction that occurs over the barrel of a gun, which is just a general term. <laughs> general term I use for uh, somebody being forced. Someone who says, well, I didn't really agree to that. And you say, well, you're, you're going to have to do it or else. And if, if, you, if you want to get rid of that, you have to find a way uh, that uh, people can agree on something and uh, exchange based on their agreement. And it's it's really very close to what people would call voluntarism. The only the only uh, the only difference is if if you read my book, you would you would find there are there are certain institutions you you need um, to. There are problems that that you uh, encounter like. Uh, what about the guys who don't sort of go along with the program? What about the guy who says, uh, I don't care what you think about rape and murder. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway. What do you do about that guy? Mm -hmm. and, and if you go through the discipline of trying to think of how you could cope with those problems, again, without bringing coercion into the issue, uh, there's you, you you can get to to where a contractual republic is. Okay. Okay. So you're, I, 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 it sounds like you're kind of referring to like dispute resolution organizations um, that that have been theorized, um, I guess, within anarchist circles for for some time. Yeah. I mean that that would be an element. Uh, you know, the fact that the agreements between people would would need to be engineered in a very professional way. So. You know, the, the really smart people we have right now who are employed as lawyers uh, could be sort of repurposed as uh, contract engineers who would uh, have a proprietary interest in developing excellent contracts, excellent agreements between parties that did not break down. And perhaps they would even have contracts so good they would guarantee that they didn't break down. Perhaps, hmm. those, perhaps those agreements would be insurable against breakdown. Um, so when you start to get into things to that granularity, you solve a lot of these problems. 
Huh. Very, very interesting. And that's from your, your book called The Freedom App. Where can people find that? They can only find it at Amazon. It's an ebook. It's called The Freedom App by Pete Sisko. Cool. All right. All right. Definitely uh, check that out. I'll, I'll have to get that too and, and, and take a look at it. I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm definitely intrigued. So uh, let's move forward here. This is, um, we, we complete our direct action series uh, based off the Freedom Umbrella of direct action. One of those things was perpetual traveling. I just, I hadn't, hadn't gotten in contact with you yet for that, but this will be in the, uh, uh, in the compilation of that. Uh, we examined uh, the the uh, um, the economic means, uh, all those things outside of politics. I want to talk a little bit about perpetual traveling. So I, I guess can, can you provide a definition of perpetual traveler, and then also uh, what encouraged you to uh, actually do it? The uh, perpetual traveler is is a uh, a term that I believe grew out of. Uh, uh, gee, I can't remember the name of the fellow, but it was several decades ago uh, that he came up with the idea of uh, so-called flag theory, which, which is the idea that you know you're a person is a citizen of one country, but they are a legal resident of another country. Uh, they own a company that's in a third country. Uh, the country transacts business maybe in a fourth country or online nowadays. And the person actually spends most of his time having fun and doing what he likes to do in a fifth or sixth or seventh country. Hmm. So <clears throat> the, the advantage of it is that uh, you sort of fall into a, a gray area of, uh, of who owns you. Um, you know, most people, uh, if I was born in Canada, so if you're born in Canada and you stay there all your life and you accumulate all your property there and you only have one passport, um, all your banking's done there, everything you do is in Canadian dollars, um, the, the state of Canada, they own you and, and they, they can decide uh, what's done with you. And the advantage that a permanent traveler has if he structures his life the right way is um, he doesn't really fall clearly into anybody's uh, jurisdiction. I, I happen to still be a Canadian citizen, but I also have another citizenship. I'm also a permanent resident of a third country, and I haven't been in Canada. I haven't lived there for over 30 years. Hmm. So, um, you know, it's you just the idea, among other things, is you you are not the low hanging fruit when politicians decide that they're going to make a new rule and confiscate more property and uh, add a new tax and otherwise diminish your standard of living, you're, you're not the easy guy to do that to because you're somewhere else. You've been gone a long time and uh, your assets are spread all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and actually one of my questions later on was about the, the five flag five flag theory. I think that's what it's called. Uh but yeah, you already covered that and I'm I'm glad you did. Uh so so I guess just more of just a subjective question. You mentioned you like Thailand, but uh, I guess what has been your, your favorite place to live? Uh, uh your favorite place to live. You know, there's uh, there's a few. And and uh my wife and I have very open minds about places and and we try to always see the positive when we go anywhere. So uh, because of that, there are many, many places that, that we like. Um, Thailand is, you know, really a, a wonderful place. And I had no uh, predisposition towards it. I just kept running into people who'd say, well, have you been to Thailand yet? Oh, you should go to Thailand. It's, it's really great. And it is. Uh, the, the people there are, uh, they're just very friendly. And uh, the the name that they give themselves is, you know, for tourism purposes, is the land of smiles. Hmm. But but it's it's really no exaggeration because the people do smile a lot. And and when you walk down the sidewalk, people look you in the eye and smile at you, which which is pretty rare. In, yeah, definitely. In, yeah, in Western culture, you know, um, and. The truth is, when you live there and there are people smiling at you and uh, around you uh, all the time, it, it, it has an effect, you know, it, it, it makes you happy. So it's a great place. Belize is another one in, in, uh, in Central America. 
uh, great, you know, we, we love spending time in Belize and we have over the years, we, we've spent cumulatively probably uh, two, two and a half years in, in Belize in the last 10 years. And uh, it's another place where the, the people are so friendly uh, and genuinely friendly. They're not friendly because you're a gringo and they think they can get more money from you. You know, it's not, I mean, they are genuinely friendly. They, they, uh, they're just great. So uh, that's another place. And then uh, I'll, I'll say the third one is Spain. Um, just wonderful. And the Spanish really know how to enjoy life. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean just, you know, party and go crazy and drink. I mean, they know how to enjoy life on a deep level. You know, you, you see three, four generations of uh, Spaniards uh, walking together along the ocean on a Sunday and, uh, you know, families around all the time. It's really, uh, uh, and Mexico's like that too, actually. So I, I, Mexico's another one. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, there are many great places so, that I would live. Yeah. Yeah, and I haven't done uh, personally. I mean, I, I'd like to more, uh, but uh, obviously I've been to Mexico, Cancun, and, and actually two spring breaks ago went to Ecuador. Uh, um, it was a great place. I I, I love it, but uh, yeah, we had to we had to have uh, my my dad had a foreign exchange student in high school that lives there uh, lives there currently, so we went there to visit him. And yeah, he kind of was our our guide uh, throughout it. But yeah, it's a, a beautiful uh, uh, a beautiful place, beautiful place for sure. You ever uh, have you been there? Uh, no, my daughter uh, went to Ecuador when she was 18. She went by herself and she went for about a month uh, and absolutely loved it. And again, like sort of taken in by a family and they kept in contact with her. And uh, it was a, it was a great experience for her. And uh, she, she lives in Ethiopia now. Um, and so our kids are spread around, too. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. So. Um, so obviously we, we've we're, we've kind of talked about the I guess the the benefits and, and how great it is to travel around the great places, uh, but obviously it's it's probably not easy to do though. So what what are the barriers and challenges uh, to perpetual traveling? Well, uh, it the barriers for most people are that they are you know sort of permanently entrenched in in a lifestyle back home, which was certainly us. I mean we we. Uh, we lived in uh, Idaho. We, we had a, uh, you know, substantial home there on a, on a few acres and all kinds of cars. You know, when you have teenagers, you own tons of cars and, you know, just the overheads are, are uh, phenomenal. So I, I don't, I don't want to act like I'm above all that because I was, I was neck deep in a materialistic uh, lifestyle, but what we decided when the kids got older is that we could uh, unencumber ourselves from all of that and uh, and move away. And in our case, we already had the online income part of it solved. That that is, I, I've been doing that for years. So it took us about a year and a half or two years to sell everything off. Uh, you know, the, the house, the belongings, you know, the vehicles, ab you know, just absolutely everything. And it boiled down to a very small amount. There was like family photos that we kept and, uh, and uh, certain books that are uh, sort of cherished. So we have a, a little storage facility and it's got family, it's got those white boxes in it, you know, and it's got, mm -hmm. family, photos, it's got family photos and, and certain books and just a few other things. But, but that, that is, all that's left, you know, sort of physically from that old lifestyle. And then uh, after that, we just started uh, touring the world and it's one suitcase each, you know, and the airline says suitcase has to be 20 kilos or less. So, so that's the deal. Yeah. 10 years and you get one suitcase. That's and, it. That's, uh, that's all you, that's all you have that's like to that's your that's name. <laughs> yeah. So, Talk, talk about frugal living or minimalism. Yeah, right, it is. It really is a minimalism. But I'll tell you something. The, the, it is incredibly liberating. It's just amazing. I remember after we sold our, our house and, you know, we had, we had sold it down to the bare walls anyway. And this is before the 2008 crash. So we, we were fortunate enough to get out before the, the big housing crash. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we we were in a hotel 
And we kept thinking to ourselves, yeah, how long is it till we go home? Uh, and it, it took us like three months to, to disabuse ourselves of the idea that, you know, actually there is no home. We're not, we're not going back to anything. Uh, we are, we're going forward and we're going to places we've never been before. And we're going to all these great countries that we've wanted to see. And, uh, it's it, you know it's 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 a terrific adventure. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything, and and it's full of trade offs. You know, I mean, it's there there are things that you trade off. You, like I said, you you have a suitcase with twenty kilos of stuff, so you know those that fantastic audio system that you used to have at home and you used to love to crank it up and you know listen to music <laughs> and everything. You don't get that. Uh, so you know, there's no questions that there's trade offs, but. The other thing is, you know, I mean, you spend weeks in London and 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 weeks in Amsterdam, and uh, you can go to Asia and and get a place on a beach for a song. That's the other thing that this lifestyle costs far less than the lifestyle we had, you know, back in the day with with all the trappings of uh, of a Western life. This costs way less. So hmm. you get you get ahead financially. You don't get you don't fall behind financially. You get ahead. And of course, the linchpin for most people is, yeah, it sounds great, but how do I make an income? You know, where, where's the money come from? Which is why I think an online business is is just the open sesame to to personal freedom, personal liberty, all all of those things that that resonate with. Uh, you know, your audience, right? I mean, yeah. you know, the, the, the people who care about your podcast are the people who care about liberty. And in particular, they care about individual liberty. And I have, I've cared about it all my life too, but I, I was never able to achieve it to the degree that I have until I had a, a durable, reliable online income. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get, we'll get to that here, here in a moment, but, uh, um, uh, I'm just kind of I'm thinking about myself here, and obviously uh, everyone we're all individual snowflakes, as one of my colleagues likes to say. And I mean we've all we've got we've all got different uh, issues and things. Like for me, I have I have type one diabetes. So one concern I would have with um, with uh, perpetual traveling is, I mean, like what about hospitals and medical care? Is it is it is it hard to come by? I mean, is, uh, have you gone to some places where the quality is just terrible? I mean, can can you speak to that? We have, uh, uh, and and uh, there's. It's it's another it's another little secret, you know, for the guy who is a guest in a country. Um, I was in uh, Spain. I, I I wrote a blog post about this. I was in Spain and I, I had a problem in one of my ears, and uh, I had to go see somebody. And it was like right away. It was a, it was a real problem. So we just uh, looked on Google Maps where there was a, a hospital nearby. Walked over to the hospital. Walked in. I, I explained my problem, and we only had to wait about uh, 20 minutes or so, and that's only because they had to find uh, a person who could speak English uh, with us, as our, my Spanish is, you know, just very poor. I have the Spanish of an 18-month-old Spanish child. So uh, that's the only reason we had to wait at all, really. And they got me in to see uh, not just a physician, but an ENT. I saw a specialist. And uh, she diagnosed uh, what the problem was. She gave me uh, three medications, one of which was a scheduled drug that the DEA likes to catch people with. <laughs> um, all of that was, I think, uh, $80 out the door. And, the, and here's another thing. It's a small thing, but it means a lot to me. They literally did not take my name. There was absolutely no paperwork whatsoever. Wow. No, there wasn't, there was absolutely nothing to fill out. They just focused on, here's a guy, what's his problem? How can we help him? And then they, they, they gave me a prescription and I, I took it over and I did when at the pharmacy where I paid like another $20 or something, you know, obviously I paid euros, but the equivalent of peanuts and uh, they, because they were giving me a scheduled drug, a serious drug, they did ask to see my passport. But that was it. They recorded the information out of my passport, gave me the drug. And uh, 
that is that's a typical story. Like there are thousands of people people that will tell you that story. Um, uh, Connie was in Thailand, and and had a problem, and not to go into the whole story, but uh, she saw two specialists and had a uh, CAT scan done, and the CAT scan was read not by a technician but by a radiologist within hmm. fifty within fifteen minutes. And again, uh, a diagnosis and prescriptions and out the door, and it was about $200. And, and that's two, two specialists, CAT scan, radiology, you know, radiologist, you know, diagnosis, prescription, the, the whole thing out, out the door. Wow. So, and of course, you can carry insurance for all of this, and, and it's available. But the point is, in most of the world, Medical care is not outrageously expensive, and the and the small things you run into can be uh, taken care of, and it's really just not that expensive. Wow, yeah, that's incredible. That is uh, it's definitely incredible because I know just for for a month's supply of insulin, it's like two hundred fifty or three hundred bucks here. So yeah, that's I don't know, maybe 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 that's uh, something something to look into. But uh, you mentioned making money on the internet, and uh, I guess uh, that's kind of that's I guess one thing that I'm interested in. Uh, so, so I guess from, from your experience, what are, what are the best ways to, to make money on the internet? You know, the thing that I uh, tell people, because we, we work with a handful of people at a time, because we, uh, I have a, a, a different kind of service than what people are, are used to. I don't have a video course or something like that. I actually work with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. And the thing that I tell people is there, there are, 10,000 ways to, to make money uh, online. Proven, absolute, don't even worry about it, ways to make it. It's a, it's a more than a trillion dollar economy. It, it could be around $2 trillion now. It's, it's absolutely massive economy. And there's no, it's not even a challenge to find ways to make money online because there's so many that you can just look up and it's very well settled. So what I tell people is the real secret is to find something that will provide you a durable income for like, and by durable, I mean five, 10, 15 years doing essentially the same thing. And you build it over time, just like you would if you started a brick and mortar business. You know, nobody starts a brick and mortar business and says, Hey, if I can make money for 12 or 18 months, I'm, you know, I'm good. You know, <laughs> and you really, I think you're better off to look at it that way uh for an online business because you sleep better at night when you when you know you're building something that you can reasonably expect to be there many years down the road and the the trick is to investigate and discuss the things that you are most keenly interested in and then try to engineer a business that encompasses those exact things um, you know, if, if you, you know, if I were talking to you and you said that, that uh, uh, individual liberty is like e extremely important to you, absolutely paramount mm -hmm. and the, and the ability to travel, then what the challenge is to find ways to engineer a business so you can incorporate those elements. So that's sort of what you eat, sleep, and breathe every day. And then that gives you that deep satisfaction that you're doing something you really love and you expect that you will continue to love to do it for 5, 10, 15 years. That's really where the magic happens for people because part of, part of the whole personal freedom equation is personal happiness. So uh, you, you can't do better than when you are working and making an income, doing something that really makes you happy. So definitely. that's the fun is to end, is to engineer something like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I mean, I've had I've had my radio show, and I, I have an alternative media website too, where I read I read a bunch of articles and such. Um, and I mean, for for the like up until I was October of last year, I, I got I got laid off. And uh, I have having trouble finding uh, work since I am in college, so that kind of uh, uh, messes things up a bit. So in the past, I, I would say 
the past eight months, I've really uh, there's been a major learning curve in trying to because before, like I had a, I had a decent job and I was I didn't the the show was just a hobby essentially. I didn't need to uh, make money off of it. But after that happened and I'm kind of in this position, it's less. I'm thinking, well, if I can to me if I can make it profitable, then that's 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 what I want to do. Uh, and I've I've been finding out finding out a new uh, a lot of new things, but uh, still still uh, it's it's a process. It's a process and. Uh, I think I might have to expand outside of outside of this realm uh, onto other things in order to, to to profit on the internet. Well, you're close. You know, the, the challenge for you, you already have an audience. The, the challenge is to is to find ways to monetize, and mm -hmm. you, you already know the the nature of what you do from a from a technology standpoint. Uh, everything you need can can fit in a suitcase, and and you could produce your podcast from Mexico or or Thailand or South America or, you know, where, wherever you wanted. Um, so you're close, you know, <laughs> you're, you may be closer than you realize you are. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that would, yeah, that'd be, that'd be incredible. So yeah, I've, I've, I've been looking at ways to monetize unless you have, and, and, and the thing about uh, Liberty Under Attack Radio is we don't, uh, we don't talk about politics or the news cycle. We focus on solutions on finding freedom now, which is why I see a lot of value in things like financial independence, making money on the internet, and perpetual travel, uh, perpetual travel, uh, perpetual traveling. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's so, there's so many, so many things that you you can do on the internet, uh, as you were kind of saying. Just so many, so many things. Uh, and the, the hardest thing, yeah, since we don't focus on politics and the news cycle, what people, a lot of the larger shows focus on. Uh, it's, it's taken a while to grow an audience and like with things like AdSense and there's something called coin URL, it's AdSense only with Bitcoin. Uh, you got to have, uh, uh, a lot of traffic to your website. And, uh, I guess we, we're kind of in a really, a really narrow niche. So after people, I guess, come to, uh, understand voluntarism and, and, uh, individual liberty, uh, they come to us for, for the solution. So it's, it's taken a little while to build up the audience, but, uh, I, I've, I've, I'm definitely, definitely hopeful, uh, that, it, that it will, uh, that we've. Uh, we'll begin to see it uh, grow uh, pretty quickly. So, right. the the advertising model is is a tough one because you you need massive amounts of traffic in in order to make money on that advertising model because you know frankly you're you're paid pennies for uh, uh, each uh, viewer you have uh, on an on an advertising model. So the the the, the more the the quicker path to something lucrative for you would be to find uh, a handful of solutions for people uh, that that you could introduce them to that that you could offer to them depending on you know whether or not you want to uh, just curate the solutions from elsewhere or, or whether you want to create them on your own but uh, that's when when you have a tightly focused niche like you do, um, that is the way you would look to monetize it: is to find valuable solutions for those people. You know, they listen. People are listening to your podcast uh, because they they like what you have to say, and they listen week after week because they trust you and they like the way you provide the information and. If you make a recommendation to them for something, they would be they'll, they'll give it the benefit of the doubt. You know, they'll they'll check it out. So if if you systematically build a credible reputation by always doing what you say you'll do and and delivering on what you say you'll deliver, uh, you will create uh, a, a very loyal following. And I, I have a term for that. Uh, I call it a nano economy. And the, the idea is <clears throat> that it's it's a a tiny economy. Nano means a billionth, you know. So uh, right now, if you have one billionth of the global economy, it's worth seventy five thousand dollars a year. So that's a pretty good. That's an interesting number to work with. So if you if you create a nano economy for yourself, um, you make seventy five thousand dollars a year, and and it's. It's doing it inside this little uh, ecosystem that you own and control. Mm -hmm. um, people who listen to your podcast, you have their email addresses, or um, you know you know how to reach them by RSS feed, 
and uh, you can interact with those people on a Facebook page or somewhere else. They can interact with you. They can ask you a question. Um, email addresses are great because there really aren't any intermediaries uh, between you and someone that, that you email. And you can develop uh, your own ecosystem, your own little economy, and you can all if you offer those people something of value, something that they're genuinely glad to have, something that costs $20 and they say, Shane, please take my $20 and, and give me uh, what, uh, what you're offering. That, that, that true value for value transaction that, that is actually the, the backbone of human civilization. Uh, when you have the ability to participate in, in an economy with people on that level, uh, that economy itself, that, that ecosystem becomes your largest financial asset because it, it can make you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year, year in, year out. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll, that's, that's, that's a, a very good way, a very good way you put that. And actually in research for, um, the uh, the direct action series back in I think it was end of last year. Yeah, I did look into the nano economy thing, but I was a little I was a little confused. But uh, yeah, you just clarify that. That makes perfect sense now. Yeah, uh, very good, very good. So yeah, the, uh, the, yeah go know, ahead. I, I have when I write about that, I have an example where I just show a thumb drive, you know, that's sitting in my hand. But what's on the thumb drive? Well, uh, I offered my first e product back in two thousand and one. You know, so that's that's fifteen years ago now. So so. On that thumb drive, I have the email addresses of over 100,000 people. I have every e-product that I've ever created, every video explaining something that I've ever created, every podcast that I've uh, that I've created that that, uh, that I have ownership of. I, I wouldn't put your podcast on there because that's yours, not mine. But uh, all of these things are uh digital property they all they all fit on a uh, on a thumb drive and they're all peculiar to me you know the, the people on there want to hear about uh something that i have if, if i if i left that thing laying in the street and somebody found it it, it does, it's not actually worth very much money or maybe anything to somebody else and that's the beauty of it there's 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 this entire economy that generates me and I, I, I say this and I mean it literally it makes me money every single day uh, and it fits on a thumb drive and uh, that is a magnificent thing and because of cryptocurrency I, I could also have my operating capital uh, on that thumb drive because I, I could have uh, you know four or five six figures of of cryptocurrency also on there uh, that is an absolutely astonishing thing in, in terms of the, the evolution of human society. We're, we're actually at a point now where the little guy, Joe Average, can, can have something like that in the palm of his hand, a an economy that he owns and controls. I mean, that is the most fantastically liberating thing that you can imagine because you can you can go off and live in New Zealand or, you know, you can, you can live in Africa, you can live in Southeast Asia, you can, you can just travel around all the time and, and you still have that in your back pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely, uh, it's definitely incredible. And uh, actually that transitions nicely into the next thing I was kind of going to kind of bring up with you. Uh, <clears throat> The the I've I, I've been interested in, in cryptocurrency for 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 probably about a year now, uh, but my I guess my qualms then were uh, I couldn't I couldn't buy it uh, anonymously. I struggled for, with that for for so long. I wrote an article on it. I had to go through like a virtual gaming currency website and lose like ten or fifteen dollars in transaction fees, uh, which which sucked. But uh, um, there's been there's been something new I came across. And it's it's gaining traction. It's called it's called Steam. It Steam is the new I guess a newer cryptocurrency. And uh, I just randomly started blogging on this on this website, and it pays you out from the. It's like a blockchain based social media platform. It's really really interesting. Uh, but yeah, so I, I wrote articles and I got uh, I made a, made some decent money off of that. So I actually had Bitcoin, and I, I know exactly what you mean when you talk about it, it being liberating because 
I because and I guess another reason I didn't invest in Bitcoin was because I don't I can't like I, I live in the communist state of Illinois in central central Illinois and there's nowhere to use cryptocurrency so it's like there's not really any point for me to have it uh, unless I'm just going to invest in it and, and try to double my money or something but uh, I actually had it so I started doing some experiments. And uh, I'm a big I'm a big privacy advocate, and uh, I'm able to um, uh, get the Bitcoin or get the Steam dollars off of off of Steam it, tra- uh, uh, convert those into Bitcoin anonymously without having an account, and then I can uh, buy gift cards uh, to anywhere I want here in town uh, anonymously as well. And I even had a uh, um, there, there's a website called Foodly I think. And uh, yeah, I, I ordered food delivery with uh, with Bitcoin. So and, and it was like I know that's just, those are just minor things, but I really didn't know the possibilities with with Bitcoin uh, with with Bitcoin specifically at this point. And just the I guess the I guess the the chance of, of like making money off of cryptocurrency. So yeah, it definitely is is definitely is liberating. I've been really excited about this for the past couple of weeks because just it's it's a, it's a new experience. It's a new experience. Yeah, I don't uh, understand a lot about cryptocurrency from a technical standpoint. It's 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 way over my head. In, mm, me too. <laughs> in terms, yeah, in terms of how the technology works, but it, the the fundamentals of of having a currency that is is not under state control, and it it essentially derives its value from millions of people in the marketplace who agree on its value. Uh, that works for me because um, I, I think really that's, you know, the, I mean, that's the value of a Picasso painting is uh, there's nothing intrinsically valuable about the canvas and the oil. It's, it's just that there is a market of people who agree amongst themselves, yes, that painting's worth $10 million. Um, that's, that's where it derives value from. And uh, it doesn't bother me that Bitcoin is not a precious metal um, uh, and that it derives its value sort of from a consensus in a marketplace. That's fine. Uh, and it's to me, it's far better than fiat currencies mm-hmm. that, that are, are basically derive their value from a confidence game from from lies and misrepresentations that are that are given to a mass of people and as long as they keep believing what isn't true uh the the currency can retain its value uh i I think that when the u.s government owes what couple hundred trillion dollars in in debt there there's there's just no there's no rational argument for how the value of those dollars will 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 continue in a steady state. Uh, they they have to decline, and and of course we are reminded that historically, every paper currency in the history of the world has eventually fallen to a value of zero. Yep. Uh, except the ones that are in circulation right now, but all the others have eventually fallen to a value of zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is uh, that is definitely true, definitely true. So, um, so so I guess you you, you mentioned uh, that that mo- you make all your you make a hundred percent of your money off of the internet. Uh, we interviewed uh, Jake DeSillis on financial independence and early retirement uh, back in January, and um, that he he mentioned I think there's four ways to, four ways to quit the rat race. I think is I, I think is a speech that he gave. Um, he, there's uh, un, um, I, I guess are you are you familiar with the, the four ways to quit a rat race? First off. I, I, I've read Jake's books and I was hoping that, that you weren't going to ask me the four ways because I'm not sure I've got them committed to memory. There was the super saving. There, yep, was intensive like, saving. Yep. Yeah, intensive saving. And there was uh, build a business and sell it, I think was correct, one of them, which is what he did. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was, uh, I think, online business is, is one of them where you uh, continue to have a source of income because of an online business. What, what would the fourth one be? Well, yeah. So, so there's unjobbing, which would be like freelancing, uh, uh, things, things like that. Intensive saving is, yeah, just saving ninety percent of your income in ten years, and then just uh, making, uh, and then living off of your investment dividends, essentially. Uh, passive income would be like just an online business that gives you a steady flow of income each month or each week or whatever, whatever time frame. Um, and then yeah, the the uh, um, there's a lifestyle business, which I think is kind of kind of what uh, kind of what you do is, um, I mean, uh, you 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 haven't uh, retired per se. 
uh, as far as I know. You just make you just make money off of, I guess, writing books and, and doing whatever else you do on the internet. Um, be something it'd be a job that you enjoy to do. Uh, and then I think there's I think there's one more as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't remember, but do you do anything else? Like, do you, do you have like an investment portfolio or is just all of your money made from, from the internet? Well, the, the, the income itself all, all comes off of, uh, online. Um, you know, what, what I, what I do with the money after that, I, I don't, I don't really talk about too much, but there's nothing, Fair enough, yeah. I, I, I don't have anything really super innovative there anyway, where I could say, well, wow, this is, this is the secret you see. Uh, that's, that's not where the special sauce is as far, you know, in my case, in, in, in my case, it's that, uh, uh, engineering, a, a, an online business so that you're doing something very interesting that you really enjoy doing delivers a lot of value to people and they love you and you create this, uh, um, nano economy of your own. And mm-hmm. I, I started many, many years ago, I, I developed a, a very efficient way of lifting weights and building muscle for, for uh, people who wanted to do weightlifting and they wanted to gain muscle mass. And I, I, I developed a way that's just, it's based on math and physics and, and measurement, quantification, every step of the way. And it really works uh, very well. And uh, I wrote about, I started doing it uh, in paper books before anybody was on the internet back in the, in the mid nineties. Uh, but I switched to eBooks early on. I was an early adopter of eBooks in, in 2001 and uh, gravitated everything to the, to the online world. And that is something that has uh, made me a lot of money. And I, I, I know an awful lot about online business because of that. And over the years, I've had so many people come to me and say, will you show me, you know, I'm interested now in my own online business. Will you help me? And uh, it's, it's only very recently that I have uh, started another business where I actually do that. And I, I help people. But as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a boutique business where I, I, I work with only uh a few dozen people at a time and it's all, it's all one-on-one mentoring. Yeah. Okay. Very, very good. Very good. So uh, I know you kind of already answered this, but one of the things with the direct action series uh, and the freedom umbrella direct action is to show the, the sheer possibilities uh, of the economic means, you know, the, the voluntary, yeah, voluntary interactions rather than uh, politics, which, which is, which is coercion. Um, and, and it'll be kind of a, a redundant one, but one, one, this is another case study, uh, ha, has perpetual traveling, um, have, uh, you're uh, making money on the internet. Has that helped increase your own personal freedom? Oh, enormously. You know, I, I, I just, I can't overstate the, the difference that it makes, you know, and wh- one of the things is that you, you kind of fall into this gray area when, when you are in a country as a tourist, which, which is, you know, officially my designation. When I'm in Thailand, I, I'm there on a tourist visa. Um, or in Mexico, you know, I'm a, I'm a tourist. I'm not a legal resident there. And uh, you only have a certain amount of time under those arrangements. Um, you know, I, I, could, I could be in the United Kingdom for six months, uh, but I can only be in Spain for three months. And then I have to leave any, any EU country uh, you could be there for 90 days, well, depending on your passport, but most top tier passports, you could be there for 90 days and then you have to leave for 90 days, go somewhere else. And then you, and then you could come back, uh, but only for 90 days. So <laughs> the thing, the thing about that is you, you're actually treated very well. You know, if the, if the police stop you for something, you know, a traffic thing, or, you know, you're, walking along the beach and they're questioning people as soon as they know you're a tourist uh it's all smiles uh everybody gets everybody gets treated nicely you know when you're a tourist you're you're still welcome in most countries uh so it's a it's a nice way to live you don't you don't fall under all the rules where the locals are getting jacked up for whatever the latest policy is and mm-hmm. being clamped down on or, or uh, whatever's happening to them. You just sort of fall through those cracks. It doesn't apply to you. And uh, that that's a very nice 
that's a very nice way to live. And, you know, you mentioned you don't talk about politics. That's that's the other thing is when you're in these other countries, particularly when you don't speak the language, you don't become embroiled in that. You know, your mind goes elsewhere. And uh, it's uh, much more mentally peaceful to not be thinking about those things all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, which is that's something that I struggle with because I, I tend to be political because it irks me so much when I see what <laughs> politicians do. It drives me nuts. And and I have to actually pay attention so that it doesn't drive me nuts because you can become so embroiled in it. But at least when you're in other countries where you don't speak the language, there's there's no risk of that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I would, I would, I would, I guess I would posit that like, uh, like we, I've, we've gone up to Canada to go to fishing, fishing a couple of times, and even like I know that that's only that was that's only like a couple of weeks, but, uh, but at the same at the same time, like even even when it's when it's English and you're watching it, like you don't, I mean, I don't know how the Canadian government works really. Uh, I don't understand anything that's going on. I, I get disinterested, so I think that'd kind of be the same thing, uh, going going elsewhere too to other English speaking right. countries. Right, because when when you're having your morning coffee and you see a headline says you know new fifteen percent tax on something, you don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that that again that, that is actually liberating. So uh, that's a long answer to your question. You know, do you do you feel like being a permanent traveler in, increases your uh, your sense of personal freedom and a- absolutely i mean enormously i mean that's why that's why i do it uh it's it it makes a huge difference and not to mention the fact that no matter what country you live in you live in a bubble um that's just all there is to it you know you, your your national media your local media they're all regurgitating the same stories Mm-hmm. They're all focused on the same things, and it's a big world out there. There's a lot going on, and you you don't get to hear about it, you know. So no matter what country you're in, you 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 live in a bubble. And one of the things I noticed about uh, living in Belize, which is one of the first countries I moved to when we started all this, was people just aren't plugged into that. They just aren't. You know, CNN is not on the television. And people sit around and laugh and tell stories and they make plans for, hey, tomorrow let's go out on a sailboat. And uh, Saturday there's this, you know, big event at one of the beach bars. Let's meet up there. And it's they are focused on things that improve the quality of their life. And they, there's nobody, it, this doesn't, all these other things just don't get talked about. And it is a wonderful way to live. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so I've got a couple more questions. We'll, we'll, we'll keep this to an hour because I'm sure you're sure you're a busy guy. Um, I mean, this is, is something I asked uh, uh, asked uh, Jake Desilis too. But I mean, so so whenever you uh, like, whenever you decided to be. Be, uh, start perpetual traveling did you have uh like a, you you had kids where they were they grown up to the point where you didn't really have to care for them or at least financially or or, or did they just travel with you yeah well I'll, I'll tell you about that and by the way i don't don't uh, stop on my account if we if we run over an hour it's okay with me but I okay mess, no problem I mess up your format uh when we started traveling uh, we have we have uh, six kids and they're they're all clustered together in age and right now as we speak uh, they are they all happen to be in their twenties but uh, in December one of them's going to click over to thirty so we're going to start that uh, sector of our lives but anyway they're all pretty close together and when we started uh, experimenting with this we we did travel and uh we took uh the two youngest ones with us um we we uh drove through mexico we uh drove uh, about five thousand miles i think through 10 mexican states just a giant road trip you know through a lot of the u.s states too but the the fun part was going into mexico and and uh, spending time there we drove down to uh, cozumel which as you know is on an island so we put our vehicle on a ferry and went across to cozumel right at the end uh and it was it was just a great time you know i mean uh you've got teenage 
uh, kids and you're going to the cheats and eats of pyramid and uh, seeing all these interesting uh, 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 Mayan ruins and artifacts and things and just cool geographic things, cenotes and swimming in the ocean and all that great stuff. So that that was a that was a wonderful education. Went up into into Canada a couple times and explored around up there. Uh, but uh, they, they were they were just transitioning to the point where the the youngest one was getting 18, 19 years old and looking for things to do. And they're adventurous anyway. I have four sons, and all four of them now have lived in mainland China and taught English. Um, so, and, and, uh, one of them has been around the world. Uh, uh, he married a girl from Spain. Uh, they lived in Mexico, lived in Belize. They've, they've been all over the place. So they, hmm. they got it. They got an early start in those teen years and then, uh, they, they've continued on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the, the question I was going to ask in regards to that is, uh, um, obviously children, children are expensive. Um, so I, I guess like trying to, um, I guess, uh, uh, whether it's financial independence or perpetual traveling, uh, I mean, do, do you think it's, it's best to forego parenting until, uh, until you, uh, get to that point where you're financially, like financially, I guess, uh, uh, financially stable or financially independent? Well, you know, that, that's a deeply personal decision that uh, people have to make and it's fraught with trade-offs. You know, I, uh, I, you know, speaking personally, being a dad has been the, the greatest thing in, in my life, I, and I wouldn't have traded it for anything. Um, but that said, a, anybody has to recognize that, that there's, there are going to be trade-offs. But here's another way to look at it. You know, like uh, you might think, well, you know, I'd love to live in Ecuador, but, you know, I got to wait until after I have a family or can't start a family until, but, you know, people in Ecuador have children. And that's that's the thing you got to keep in mind is you could still go live somewhere and have a great family, um, and most places uh, outside of um, the sort of top tier U.S. you know Western Western Europe, uh, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, most places have a have a lower cost of living anyway. So there is a possibility you can have your cake and eat it too if you go live in a place where the expenses just aren't nearly as high. Because yeah, it is expensive to have kids, but it's not as expensive in other countries. And you can, mm -hmm. you can really have a great life. We live with our kids in Mexico. We live with them in Belize. And it's, it's a very rich life. And it doesn't cost very much money. Okay. Very good. Very good. And yeah, that, 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 I think that was more in regards to the intensive saving. Um, cause I, like if you've got to save 80 per 80% or 90% of your income at like a 40 hour per week job, yeah, kids will cut into that. But yeah, in, in your, yeah, in your position or for per perpetual traveling, I think it could, uh, I don't, I don't think that question really applies, but, uh, I guess, uh, um, I do want to discuss expatri expatriation real quick because I haven't been able to have anyone on that actually expatriated. So, uh, I guess how complicated was, uh, was the process and how much did it cost to do? Well, technically, uh, I became an expatriate when I was 26 years old, which is which is now 30 years ago, uh, when I, I left Canada and I moved to the United States, and I, I did that legally. Um, so that's sort of that was the first time I became an expat was uh, doing it that way, which was, you know, that that. I wasn't even I wasn't even that wasn't even a goal. You know, I was just sort of moving from one. Uh, I worked for a company and they, they moved me to the U S it was a piece of cake because they took care of it. Uh, but, yeah. but, it, but as far as, uh, leaving the United States, um, as, as a legal resident, I, 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 I mean, I don't know, you know, because I did surrender my green card and I did, I did, you know, sort of legally move away and do all of that stuff. Uh, it's, I don't know what to say. It's not that hard. I mean, step one is you just move, uh, <laughs> because nobody, nobody's controlling that, you know, you could get on a plane tomorrow to any country in the world and just decide you're not coming back and presto, you're an expat. So that part's easy. 
Okay, interesting. Yeah, I guess, I guess that is yeah, I guess that that is true. But as I, I know, obviously, uh, uh, I know here in the United States, I, I looked to try to see how much it was, but it was really expensive. If you actually want to become like legally expatriated, uh, the expatriation tax is quite expensive. Yeah, uh, I think what you're talking about is renouncing your citizenship. Yeah, which yeah. is that's beyond being an expat, you know, because there there are millions of Americans who live all over the world, and and those guys are those guys are expats, but not not many of them have renounced their U.S. citizenship, which is a that's a whole step beyond. And you're right; they keep raising the cost of that, and I, and I don't know. It's up around a couple thousand dollars now, or something. And they want to scrutinize all your tax records and make sure they have squeezed every nickel out of you, you know, before you go, and all of that. And um, so that's that's a that's a whole other project. Um, but for mo- most people, it doesn't apply anyway because. Most people say my wife is a, is an American, and in fact, all of, all of our kids are American. Uh, most people say, "Yeah, well, you know, I want to live in different places, but uh, I'm actually not prepared to give up my citizenship." And and that the other thing that compounds the difficulty of that is if you don't have another citizenship, uh, because they they really don't like making people a stateless person which I understand legally it, it, it can be arranged, but uh, that's that's a tough road to go because, you know, you can imagine trying to get on a airplane these days with absolutely <laughs> no, no passport document from anybody. You know, I, I understand it can be done, but uh, I don't know enough about it to, uh, to and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it's not something I would say, hey, go ahead and do that. I didn't do it, so I, I wouldn't have the nerve to tell someone else to do it. But anyway, you know, if, even if you want to give up a U.S. citizenship, you, you, you really got to get another one first. And that is, uh, that's not an overnight process. And unfortunately, we live in a world where, where there are tiers of what those passports are worth, you know, and, and uh uh, if, if you have a, a, a passport from the Netherlands, that's great. Uh, if you have one from Palestine, it, I mean, if, if they could even get one, you know, or <laughs> Afghanistan, you know, and, and a, a passport from Afghanistan is not a good one to have. So who in their right mind would trade that for a U.S. passport? True. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. That is true. So, so I guess we'll, we'll, we'll begin to wrap this up. I guess, uh, what are some good resources for folks if they're interested in learning more about making money on the internet, perpetual traveling, uh, uh, or uh, I guess, yeah, uh, any more resources on that that you could provide to the listeners? You know, I, I don't have a ready list of resources. If people have any questions about what I talked about, uh, maybe we can put a link at the end of this and they're, wel- they're welcome to contact me. Um, you know, the, the, I think everybody knows you have to be very careful with in the make money online uh, uh, <laughs> sphere, you know, because it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is fraught with ridiculous ideas of overnight riches and um, uh, cookie cutter solutions. So we didn't, we didn't go into that, but you know, if, 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 you know, just be very, very circumspect before you, uh, pay money for anything related to making money online. But certainly if, if, if any of your listeners had questions, I, I'd be happy to help them. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And I'll put a, uh, I'll put a, I'll put a, um, in the show notes, I'll put that, that link and I'll put that link in there. Uh, okay. Very good. Very good. And, uh, you had, uh, um, are there any books you want to promote or any websites? Uh, you know, I, I, I told you about my freedom app book, which, uh, you, you can get, it's dirt cheap and, and, uh, it's uh, filled with uh, interesting information for people who really care about whether or not freedom could uh, be created in uh, on Earth in the next, say, century. It's not a it's not a quick solution. Give it fifty to hundred years. It's a, it's an idea that could work. Um, anything uh, you know, as far as improving your life of personal freedom uh, in a, in a more immediate sense, you know, that's, that's kind of what I work on day to day. So people could reach me at, uh, Pete dot com, and, and they can reach me at, uh, resilient personal freedom dot me.